pop quiz time. What is something you always need but never have enough of? Time? Absolutely. Chocolate? For me, yes, this is true. Energy storage? Most definitely. Today, we have a variety of different options when it comes to energy storage. Lead acid batteries, lithium ion batteries, and my personal favorite, supercapacitors. Each of those different mediums are great for specific applications. But what if we could do even more with them? Well, that's what we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, there is a growing demand for more energy storage with more power, longer range, and longer run time. But the question remains, how can we increase our energy storage given the energy storage mediums on the market today? With the help from high-voltage charge solutions, that's how. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Anthony Wynn from Analog Devices joins me to discuss the details of high-voltage energy storage, why stacked battery cells are crucial to these kinds of systems, how high-voltage energy storage systems can reduce conduction loss exponentially, and what kind of high-voltage charging solutions from analog devices are on the market today. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Analog Devices. Hi, Anthony. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Emilia. Thank you so much for having me here today. Absolutely. Okay, we're talking about high-voltage charging solutions for energy storage and backup systems today. But Anthony, before we get into the details... What is driving the need for energy storage and backup systems today? And what kind of solutions are best for both of these issues? Yes, uh, Emilia, there is a, an ever-increasing demand for mobility and a strong desire for a cleaner environment. So one aspect of mobility can be seen in the power tools area where we want to break free from the power cord. For example, you know, we prefer to use a cordless leaf blower instead of the one that is attached to a long power cord. You can see that it's so much easier to move around without the power cord. In terms of a cleaner environment, uh, we want to do things that are more environmentally friendly. Many people now choose to use e-bike for commuting in an urban area rather than a gasoline power vehicle or scooter which has emission that pollutes the air, causing smog, and possibly some health issues. And also riding an e-bike gives you a good exercise and hopefully will keep you healthy as well. So more and more equipment now use some sort of energy storage device, such as lead acid battery, lithium ion battery, and or supercapacitor for power. And as you can see, people also want more power. They want longer range, they want longer run time, and that drives the need for more energy storage capability in these equipment. Okay, so Anthony, can you explain a bit more the difference between these different types of energy storage? Yes, there are three very popular energy storage mediums used today. The first one is the lead acid battery. Lead acid is the oldest rechargeable battery in existence today. This 150 plus year old technology was invented by a French physician, Gaston Planté, in 1859. So lead acid is still very popular for use in cars, in wheelchairs, in scooters, golf carts, and an interruptible power supply or UPS system due to its low cost. The second type is lithium ion battery or some sort of lithium based battery. Lithium is lightweight and has a very high energy density. So it is the universally accepted battery today for portable applications such as cell phones, tablets, laptops, and in heavy industry, in electric vehicle powertrains, and also in satellites. The third one is supercapacitor. Sometimes it's also known as ultra capacitor. This is like, you know, not a, your regular capacitor, but capacitor has a very, very high capacitance. Supercapacitor has very low internal impedance which enables it to charge and discharge very quickly. It is the best choice for applications where rapid charging and discharging are needed. 
know, for example, supercapacitor is used to power the you know, automatic pilot shuttle in a modern warehouse where the shuttle needs to be charged and discharged in a matter of seconds. The supercapacitor also has very high power, high current capability, even though it doesn't have as much energy density compared to the lithium iron battery. So it is common for people to use supercapacitor in parallel with battery to increase the instantaneous peak power capability of the total system. While the battery bears the needed energy and the average power, the supercapacitor is the one that gives the instantaneous peak power, peak current in the system. You know, for example, say if you use an e-bike, the e-bike need a lot of high power during startup. When the bike is going uphill, when you accelerate, the motor needs instantaneous high power during these instances. And a supercapacitor can bear most of the load there. A uh, supercapacitor also helps to absorb the high energy during uh, regenerative braking. You know, when you brake the e-bike, that energy is actually being recovered and put back to the battery. In this case, the supercap absorbing that energy, especially when the bike is going downhill, there's a lot of energy needs to be absorbed there. Okay, so Anthony, how do we increase energy storage capacity? People want higher power, they want longer range, right? So they want higher storage capacity. There are a few different ways to increase the energy storage capability here. Let's say we have many battery cells and each single cell of that battery can hold a certain amount of energy. Now you can pack more of these cells together in either parallel or in series to increase the total system energy storage. So it's very simple, just pack a whole bunch of them together. Now there's a difference when you put them in parallel, the voltage of the pack is the same as of a single cells, but the pack's current is the sum of all the cell currents together. So for example, you have an N number of cells in parallel that will give you a system with an N times the single cells current capability. Now, when you stack the cells in series or stacking them, right? You put the cell in series or stacking them, you know, one on top of another, the pack current is the same as a single cell because the current now going in series, but the pack voltage is higher. So it's the sum of all the cell voltages together. So with an N cell, N number of cells in series or stack, it gives you a system with an N times the single cell's voltage. In other words, parallel cells has low voltage, higher current why stacking cell has higher voltage but lower current. Both configuration can give you the total amount of increased energy storage that you need. Fantastic. Now, there are parallel cells and stacked cells. Can you describe this in a little more detail, especially about their differences? Yes, let's get into a little bit more detail here. You know, I'm going to get into a little more calculation. Say so to start with a, a lithium battery cell that is rated at, say, 1.5 amp hours. You know, sometimes they say, 1,500 milliamp hours, it's the same thing. This means that the battery can provide you a one hour of energy at 1.5 amp loads. So the exact calculation of the energy is a little bit tricky since the battery cell voltage operates between 2.7 volt to 4.2 volt. 4.2 volt is when it's fully charged and 2.7 volt is when it's fully discharged. Let's just use the nominal voltage at 3.7 volt for a rough calculation. So for a single cell V, the power is V time I, and V here is 3.7 volt time 1.5 amp. That gives you a 5.55 watts of power. The energy is power over time. So 5.55 watts time one hour, which is 3,600 seconds, that gives you 20 kilojoules. It's a bunch of number there, but the bottom line is that, okay, one cell gives you 20 kilojoules. And that can help to, you know, maybe carry the lift floor for, say, 10 minutes or so. Now, when you parallel an N cell together, we have a battery system with 3.7 volts and more current, you know, N times the 1.5 amp current. So the system power also increases N time, and 10 cells will give us a total of 15 amp current. Or giving an example of lift floor, Instead of 10 minutes, now you can have a 10 more time of that, 100 minutes or so with this uh, much energy. Now, when you stack the cells together in the series configuration, we have a battery system with 1.5 amp only because the current now in, in series, so 1.5 amp is, is the maximum current, but you have an N times cell voltage of 3.7 volts. The system power and energy also increased N time, just like the parallel case. But the system voltage is higher, 
while the current is lower. So for example, a 10 cell system here, we give you one and a half M total current, which is the same as a single cell, but 10 times more the voltage compared to a parallel configuration, and also 10 times less of the current compared to the parallel configuration. The parallel configuration gives you 15 amps total current at 3.7 volt low voltage. The stack cell gives you 10 times the voltage, you know, 37 volt, but only 1.5 amp current, which is lower. That's the difference between the two, parallel or stack cell. Okay, so Anthony, which of these configurations is more preferred than the other and why? Can you give me some examples? Oh, certainly. You know, stack cells provide the needed higher power, high energy storage, but without increasing the system current. And because of that, it is more preferred. I'll explain why. The lower current contributes to lower conduction losses. Conduction losses, I square R, which is related to the current. So the lower the current you are, the less conduction loss you are going to have. So you can build a system that either more efficient, less heat, more range, or you can use smaller conduction mediums such as smaller power components, like the power MOSFET, the future inductor. You can use smaller traces on the PCB board, smaller conductor-wise harnesses, for example, for a smaller total solution size. Let's go through a couple of examples to show exactly what I meant. So let's say example number one, Say we want to design for more efficiency, taking a total conduction resistance in the system of 100 million, just as an arbitrary number for the examples here. Again, conduction loss part P is I square R. So R is, again, the total conduction resistance in the system that coming from the power mass fest that used in the system, in the charger, from the future inductors, from the traces that used on PCB board, as I mentioned before. And also, like in an e-bike, for example, you also need to use wire harnesses to connect the battery to where the motor is. And that conductor has also a lot of resistance. And then that harness is also quite bulky in, in some cases. So assuming that all these add together 100 milliamps, in the parallel configuration with 10 cells, you get 15 amps. The construction loss is P equal to 15 amps square times 100 milliamps. That gives you 22.5 watts of power losses. That's a lot of power losses. Now, if you use the stack cell configuration, 10 cell give you one and a half M only. And the power loss here for the conduction is one and a half M square times the same 100 million resistance of the system that give you only 0 0.225 watts of conduction losses. 1% less than the parallel configurations. So in other words, the high voltage stack cells is 100 times more efficient than the parallel cells in terms of conduction losses. Let's take a look at another example where, say, if you want to design for a smaller size, but still more efficient. In this case, let's choose our total conduction resistance budget in the system of 1 ohms. 1 ohm is 10 times more than the 100 milliohm that we used on the previous example. Now, the, our conduction losses here for the stack cell configuration is 1.5 M square time 1 ohms equal to 2.25 watts. This number is still 10 times more efficient than the parallel configuration. But in this case, with 1 ohm conduction resistant budget, we can use smaller component. You know, you can use a smaller PCB traces and smaller wire harness for a smaller total solution size. To put it into perspective, say, take a look at an 18 gauge wire that has 6.4 milliohms of resistance per feet. And it has a 1.02 millimeter diameter. Now comparing this one at a 28 gauge wire, so this is a smaller wire, the number is bigger, but the wire is actually smaller. It has roughly 10 times the resistance, but it is three times smaller in diameter. So in this example, if you use the 28 gauge you know, versus the 18 gauge wire, your harness is three times smaller when we use the, the high voltage and stack cell approach. So the bottom line here is that the high voltage energy storage system reduces the total solution size and improves efficiency, and that's why it is more preferred. It is also worth noting that the high voltage energy storage system needs higher voltage charging solution to support higher voltage of the stack cells. Okay, thank you for that detailed explanation, Anthony. So high voltage energy systems are more advantageous than low voltage systems but it requires high voltage charging solutions. 
Is there high voltage charging solutions available on the market today? Yes, Amelia, you know, high voltage energy storage system require high voltage charging solution. And so that can support the high voltage of the stack cells. You know, for example, the 10 cell stacks lithium battery require 37 volt charging voltage nominally and 42 volt maximum when the battery stack is fully charged. Most charger solution today can support charging a voltage of up to about 24 volt. This can accommodate five or six cell lithium battery stacks only. To charge the larger stack, we need higher voltage charger. So I'm gonna show here some high voltage charger for Maxim, which is now part of uh, analog device. I'm showing here Max 17703. This is a high voltage lithium ion battery charger controller. The device operates from 2.5 volt to 60 volt inputs and can handle charging voltage up to V in minus 2.1 volt. What that means is that it can accommodate charging large stacks of lithium ion battery up to 13 cells. And this number is twice the cell stack battery that offered by most charging solutions out there today. So this device offers reversible protection and has multiple safety features such as safety timer, over voltage protection, current limit, open drain for signals over temperature. It can also detect input voltage short. It can also detect and precondition deeply discharged batteries. So these are very valuable uh, safety features. You can learn more about the product from its online data sheets. Showing here is, is a, uh, we also have the Max 17701. This is a very similar product with the 7703, but it's optimized for supercapacitive charging. And the Max 17702 is optimized for lead acid battery charging. Again, you can visit our website and read our online data sheets for more information about these products. Excellent. Well, Anthony, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much, Emilia. I'm very happy to be here and uh, we'll talk to you next time. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or check out YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.